Okay, we should be rolling for my lecture on modern times, uh, the Charlie Chaplin film. So I, I thought I had posted notes under discussions but on, on the film already, but uh, apparently not, um, but I will. It's, so it's, uh, it's Monday evening, so I'll, I have a Joyce, James Joyce seminar after this, and so later in the evening I'll be able to post this. Um, so Charlie Chaplin is British. He was, uh, his mother and father were both actors in, in vaudeville, really, uh, of the, the music hall, which is a very, very popular form of entertainment. Um, and, you know, it's a little like Saturday Night Live. There'd be a singers, so there'd be political satire. Um, and this is probably where you first would have seen movies too, because they would show these four or five minute movies, which were as long as movies were uh, in 1895. And Chaplin had took, was on stage by the age of six or seven. Um, his father was a pretty, pretty severe alcoholic, so he, who left the family, so they hardly ever saw his father. Sometimes he saw his father on stage um, and maybe a conversation in passing, but not really a part of his life. And his mother had mental health issues, uh, so she'd be okay for a while, but then she'd uh, have a kind of psychotic episode. And when that would happen, he and his half brother, because she'd had a relationship with another man who ran off, and so he was being raised by an unstable mom uh, and, and his half brother. When she had a, a nervous collapse, which would last a couple of months maybe, um, the kids would be put in essentially in the orphanage or, or what was really more of a workhouse. So they uh, do true. There wasn't exactly an assembly line at that point, as, as, as we see in the movie, but they would have been doing menial craftsmanship of, of some sort to try and earn their keep. Um, so he was pretty scarred by all this. And I think you, and he knew poverty firsthand. Um, and he knew what it's like to be hungry. And he knew what it was like to steal food. Um, and even be caught as a child, he was, especially since he was in the workhouse, um, which is a lot, and not yet another institution. Um, the gammon, we don't see the orphanage or the workhouse in the movie because the gammon keeps managing to run away, but her siblings have already gone there, which is kind of sad. It's, I mean, the father's shot and killed in a, uh, in a union, a, really in a uh, march for union, unionization, uh, factory workers trying to get, I mean, you see them working, you don't hear is other uh, as is so often the case today they it's they don't have a living wage they work all day long and still have trouble putting food on the table and and then of course unemployment since you could hire and fire at kind of at will uh in the, in the 30s before the unions um, managed to make things better although the unions got pretty greedy too and brought on some of their own problems but um they managed to get you know workers' compensation, um, social security was in, more or less invented around this time. Uh, it, this was all after the depression when uh, there had been a 25% unemployment rate. And there, it was seen that the increase of capitalism, which had put so many people in factories, uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't growing their own food. They, they were completely dependent on their salary and completely at the mercy of the people who owned the means of production. So the president, whom you know we see in the, doing his jigsaw puzzle, uh, would be the man who's profiting. Um, and in the simplest way possible, Chaplin makes his point very early on how uh, capitalism, as Karl Marx said, is vampiric. How, how it, you know, we've talked about the vampiric self and other, but now it's become the dominant economic system because people are, are no longer just exchanging labor for food. They're exchanging labor for money and then money for food. But the problem, of course, is that money is not food. Um, and if you're, like even today, you know, you can work 40 hours a week uh, at minimum wage, which I think is around $10. So that, that, that would be 400 a, a week, uh, 1600 a, a month. Uh, even if you're single, your rent's going to be at least um, 500. Uh, so you might you might be able to get by. You're not going to starve, but you're going to be in a basement apartment and you know basically spending down to zero every 
uh, every paycheck, which also means how are you ever going to do anything else? I mean, you're not advancing. And all the time, you're in a precarious position because by definition, especially at the time of 1936, um, the assembly line rendered, it did more than just speed up production. It rendered workers anonymous and substitutable. You didn't have to know them. You didn't have to talk to them. There was no relationship. Um, the less breaks they had, the better. We see the bathroom scene, um, which I'll talk about, about later, where he tries to have a two second cigarette. Uh, and even that is stamped out because it's anything that doesn't produce product is, is not monetizable. So uh, lunchtime, uh, the eating machine is supposed to eliminate lunchtime so they can keep working while the machine feeds them. It's a, fortunately, it's a disaster, but the very idea is horrific. And, and after the machine has literally beaten Chaplin almost unconscious, uh, the president doesn't even look at Chaplin sprawled on the floor. And he just, he turns to the owner of the machine and says, it's no good. It isn't practical. You know, not, it just, it, it just beat up my worker. Uh, whose name I don't even know, and who I randomly picked out to uh, to be the guinea pig for for this machine. Um, so there's an attempt to monetize every square inch uh, and and every second. So space and time, increasingly, because is seen as how can I monetize it? How can I monetize it? I mean, a parking space is a is a way to monetize space. I mean, there's nothing there, literally nothing there. You pay put your car there um, because your car requires space. And so you pay $3 an hour, let's say. And what have you bought? You haven't actually bought anything. I mean, the space is looks the same after you leave than as it did when you parked there. Or the way you pay for your conversations on, on, your, on your, your mobile contracts, which are, you know, there's so many different ones, but they have to figure out how to make, how to pay for conversation? How do you pay for time? What's your internet charge? Um, in which case you're paying for browsing, you're paying for Googling. These, these aren't products, any, well, they are, but they're, they're virtual products. Um, and the point is it, it all gets back to the, the paycheck. And the, this movie opens, and I'm going to give, I've made about 28 stills, which I'm actually looking at right now as I speak to you. And I'm going to, and so when you, come to this lecture, go to discussions and download or open up the file. It's going to be called Chaplin Stills because I'm literally narrating the stills in, in this lecture. So if you have that up alongside of me when you're listening to my lecture, um, then you can move from image to image. And, and I have notes down there. And you can always pause me and read the notes and then you know, uh, hit play again. So the, the first still is of just as a clock. A uh, very very big clock. It takes up the entire screen, and we saw we've seen clocks before in in the literature that we've read, but now now it's completely dominant. And the reason time is dominant is not is that time has become money. The the hourly wage is a, is a modern invention. Uh, you know, before that you got paid by the job. Like you bring in all this corn, it'll give you a certain amount of money. Once you have an hourly wage, once you have something called $10 an hour, you can squeeze more labor out of the what the individual does in that hour. And this is what Chaplin shows us at, right at the very, very beginning of the movie. First, you see the clock, um, then you see these sheep um, rumbling towards you. And if you look closely, one of them is a black sheep, which so it's a kind of a self-reference that, that the tramp, they, that's, the, that's what we call the figure that Charlie Chaplin plays in this and, and several other movies, many other movies. It's a figure that he made very, very famous. And the Tramps uh, seems to be kind of homeless, kind of, I mean, we see him employed when the movie opens, but not for long. And he hardly can ever hold down a job, uh, which is why at one point he said he wants to go back to jail because jail's an institution that makes more sense to him than the factory. He gets to read his paper, talk to the police guard, um, get fed. Uh, why wouldn't he be? In, why wouldn't he want to be in jail? He's he's outside the matrix, like in a way. He doesn't have to be pulled out of the matrix, like Keanu Reeves. He's not in the matrix. He seems to be from the Victorian ages. He doesn't. You never see him with money. You never see him buy anything. You never see him sell anything. He doesn't even seem to know money exists. He just wanders around, and things happen, and he he, he reacts 
non I'm pretty nonchalantly, no matter what happens, like even when the, the machine literally ingests him. And by the way, when it does, it makes his, him look like a strip of film going through a, a movie projector, which you guys may or may not have seen <laughs> in your lives now that everything's digital. But it's another self-reference that movies are, is, are also made by machines. Um, but unlike other products, movies are feeling machines. They are machines that produce images that help you to feel. And one reason that cinema rose, as I, I may have mentioned this in the last laugh too, it, is that people's feelings are not easily monetized. Um, so they're suppressed in the workplace. I mean, and you're not supposed to, you know, cry or shout or, uh, the less you feel, the more productive you are. Like the, the feelings have no place in this assembly line. He can't even, if he stops to try and get a fly off of his nose, uh, two or three of these little widgets go past him. And Chaplin, you know, careful to not let us even know what the hell they're making. They just, it's just some metal plate with two screws on it. It's so dehumanized. Uh, they have no sense of satisfaction that they're building anything. It's, it's a motion job, um, visually exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting on the arms, which have to keep going like this so much that when he stops, he keeps, he can't get his body to stop doing the machine like motion for, you know, 20, 30 seconds. So throughout the movie, uh, Chaplin, it, it's through humor, but nonetheless, he's showing how human relations with uh, both with other humans and our relationships with ourselves <clears throat> is becoming increasingly mechanized that we're, we are increasingly the marionettes of capitalism that, you know, we're sheep um, or the sheeple, uh, is, is that the word now? And so he does a very famous montage where the first shot is a sheep uh, hurrying past and the black sheep is he's moving with them, but it's if, in the sense that he's the tram figure, it's he's not of them. He's just with them. And that's going to be true of the whole movie that everybody else is in a herd, you know, running around doing automatically what they're supposed to do. You know, there's a moment where he's having a fight uh, with one of the other guys and they're each kicking each other in the pants. And, uh, and all he has to do is point to the widgets that are going past the guy as, as he tries to kick him. And then he goes, the widgets seem to rule. And, and this will happen later when, uh, when he's gone crazy after he's gone into the machine and comes out again um, and they're trying to stop him from pulling on all the levers uh, and he, all he has to do is it, it, he is, he avoids escape longer than you might think because he just keeps going back to start the widgets again and and as though they were hypnotized uh, the workers see those widgets moving and it's like they have no will of their own that the widgets have, have the will and they rush over it it's like tightening widgets again and then somebody stops the widgets and they try and get him again and he starts the widgets and visually Chaplin shows us that you know they're so habitual um and they're so worried it's been drilled into them that, that no widget can get past you it hasn't been tightened but here's here's the main point we see the president who takes a pill and this is the age of anxiety and depression um and there's a meme I saw uh, I don't know, a little while ago that, and it said something like feeling anxious and depressed, maybe it's capitalism, um, which I think is a very, very apt and astute comment that it, that capitalism somehow gets a pass. People have anxiety, people have depression and we localize it. Like, why do you have anxiety? Why do you have depression? But in another sense, who, you know, who doesn't? The, the issue isn't, are you anxious and depressed? The issue is, do you have the tools to cope with it? Um, Karl Marx famously said, everybody in modernity walks around with 50,000 pounds uh, on their backs, but does anybody feel it? And to a certain extent, the answer is no, they don't. We have so many compensatory strategies. We have, we're so bought into the myth of progress, the myth of efficiency, satisfaction, innovation. Those are such powerful and effective ideologies that, that we live on compensation. So we, we go to, Modernity deprives us, and then the commodities that modernity produces for us compensation for the deprivation. So the institutions in this movie are all connected rhizomatically. The factory and the department store are both factories. One is a factory of production, and the other is a factory of consumption. 
so everything in the department store is produced somewhere else and it and you can see the pendulum swing where you where people go from production to to consumption now obviously the minimum wage can would not afford much if anything that were shown in that department store certainly not the mink coat she wears or the gorgeous bed that she lies down in or even the cake um, that he promptly serves her when they get uh, when they get back inside but there are cheaper malls, um, the Eaton Center. Uh, and there's a lot of cheap things you can buy that, that offer compensation. You don't have to be rich. And, and there's some, that's kind of deliberate. And, and movies, of course, were a nickel. So they were, they were very complex compensation because they were visual and affective. Um, and they started serving popcorn and candy, which in a way was corollary to, uh, to the end. Your eyes were, were consuming the movies and you were me consuming popcorn and candy and soda and um it, 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 in a way it all came together and and not it's not i don't know what the situation is going to be when we get out of covid but it's not unusual for cineplexes to be in malls uh, the scarborough town center for instance so you know you're watching movies about commodity consumption it could literally, as in the case of something like pretty woman where they go shopping there's a lot of shopping in movies <clears throat> And and often the shopping is equated with happiness and success and falling in love, as as it is in, in Pretty Woman, that she's rejected um, when she goes shopping and looks like a streetwalker or a prostitute. And uh, when she gets gussied up again in one of the most famous scenes, she goes back to the snooty lady that wouldn't wait on her. A little like that Karen who, who uh, tells the policeman that in modern times that the girl stole the bread. We have that term now that somebody's a Karen. I feel sorry for Karens. I don't know why we picked Karen, but there it is. They're, they're, they're busy bodies. They're people who, they're judgy. They seem to, they, they, the way they convince themselves that the system is just is by turning in everybody. Um, as though there was some perfect divine system being run here and, and that these people are sinners, um, not so hungry that they stole a loaf of bread. I mean, in that scene, it's not, they, the baker's not even looking. and. Uh, he wouldn't have even known the bread uh, was stolen, and and the woman has to grab him and shove and say it, it was stolen, and it, and she did it, and then she runs into the tramp, and the tramp who wants to go back to jail anyway, sees a chance to help her out, and says no 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 she didn't steal it I stole it, and for some reason which you know Karen the Karen doubled down on it, and it's like no no it wasn't that guy it was a girl get the girl you know. I hate to say it, but what a bitch. Uh, I mean, what is, in what way is it her business in the first place? And you can't see a barefooted, hungry child running around the corner with a loaf of bread um, and you go out of your way twice to make sure they go to jail. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of atrocious, but it's, it's kind of typical too. Um, and it's part of the ideology that we're in a fair system. So if you see anybody cheating, um, Telling them, well, in 2008, the entire global economy collapsed and nobody went to jail. Nobody. Uh, the, the level of thievery and stealing that had to occur to crash the world economy is, is it, you know, that that's where we got the expression too big to fail. Well, I, I, they were also too big to go to jail. Bob Dylan has a great line where he says, steal a little and they'll throw you in jail. Steal a lot and they'll make you king. And we've just lived through four years of, of the Trump era. Uh, how many crimes has Trump committed? I don't, God knows he's lost track. He's never been charged. Will he ever be? I'm not holding my breath. Uh, um, so you put somebody in jail for stealing a loaf of bread, but if, if they don't pay millions or even if they're a corporation, even billions of dollars in taxes, which is really stealing from the public uh, trust, you know, corporations that did, don't pay five billion dollars in taxes. That's money that is taken away from hospitals, public schools, uh, parks. Obviously, uh, everything that we enjoy as a community, and it's no problem for the wealthy because they can afford private schools, they can afford private health, they can live in a in, in a house that's in a yard big. It might as well be a park. So they don't have to be communal. This is one of the problems of capitalism, is that we've lost a sense of community, and now capitalism. Uh, encourages you to to be individual so so ever, have your own outdoor pool if you can afford it but don't pay your taxes so the so the public pool where all the kids might be able to go in the summer 
um, you know, they have to cut down the hours or they have to close it entirely. And if you have your own backyard pool, you know, who cares? Um, same with health. I mean, if you can afford health, you can make the case of why am I paying for the for that homeless guy who broke his leg? Like I didn't break my leg. So individualism and, and, and is really a euphemism for selfishness. And the self is selfish. I mean, <laughs> why the word comes from there and that the whole design of the self is to constantly shore itself up at the expense of others with expensive things and it's but it's a bucket with a hole in it so you wind up with this rapacious aggressive competitive vampiric culture which we can see in the factory none of these men working on the line are friends they they just snarl at each other it, it, which benefits the system because it's very very hard to get collective action um out of uh when, when people are struggling so hard, they don't have time to organize, they don't have time to help other people. I remember one Christmas, Walmart actually put out a barrel inviting its employees to donate toys for, I guess, the employees. It was, it was kind of psychotic. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think the tramp's insane. I think the factory's insane. And, and the, the tramp is a Septimus figure, except he's, he's so, wonderfully able to refuse the dictates of the machine that he slips through it the machine can't seem to catch him he's, he's he's like some sand that gets into the gears literally he goes into the gears and he jams up the machine or he goes and eats a giant meal and it's like calls in a policeman to pay for it <laughs> but the policeman's gonna obviously arrest him and then while he's being arrested he the, the vendor is giving him the cigar and and the and then he invites the kids over to all get candy bars and only then does the policeman come around and the vendor sees it, the, the, the tramp's handcuffed to the policeman and, and he does the same thing. He gestures to the policeman, pay, pay the guy. Um, so, so he's like a wrench in the works where, and he jams up the, the prison system. Although in that case, he, you know, he, he say, he puts the bad guys up kind of behind bars again, which unfortunately for him gets him an early release, which is, is not something he wants. What's what's amazing about that is he, the, everywhere the tramp goes, it, it can become more humanized uh, because he doesn't respond to being inferior to the machine or to being or seeing his worth in relation to the machine. He never it never even occurs to him. Um, he has a kind of he's not uh, arrogant, but he's he seems very uh, he, he's not he's not doubting his self worth. I mean, he feels like he has a right to eat. He has a right to walk around. He has a right to exist. And the fact that the, the system is telling him, no, you don't really. Um, and they're telling the gammon the same thing. We, we, we're gonna warehouse you. We don't know what else to do. Uh, your father who was desperate from unemployment now has been shot trying to uh, improve his unemployment. And so now all the children are, are warehoused until they're 18 and probably traumatized enough that it's gonna be a real struggle to, uh, which Chaplin was. I mean, Chaplin went through that. Uh, he lived that, and uh, partly his humor brought him through it, and it, frankly, his genius. Um, and he found a, a, an outlet for it. But I think performing on the music hall stage may have saved him. He's starting at the age of seven, and people would toss coins, and so he literally could bring home money, like a decent salary. Like a seven or eight-year-old kid could actually make money in the music hall being cute and being a good dancer and being funny. Um, so he had worth from the beginning. I mean, he at nine or ten was often bringing home the money that bought the food. The the um, his brother wasn't as talented, a nice guy, and he came over to Hollywood with him, but he wasn't a comedian, he wasn't a performer, and he wasn't a director. And Chaplin was was all of those. I mean, he practically invented cinema the way we understand it now, because he was he wrote, he performed, he directed. Uh, in, in, you know, he did everything. He wrote the music. Uh, there is a soundtrack in Modern Times, which was part of Modern Times, because it, Modern Times was done in 1936. Movies had sound. You wouldn't know it by this movie, because Chaplin deliberately doesn't have any dialogue. Or when he does, it's coming out of a radio or a record player. And it's part of his protest saying that this cinema has, is not benefiting necessarily from acquiring sound. It's, it's the myth of innovation and the myth of progress. Like, well, obviously movies that have sound are quote unquote better. Well, I can think of a lot of t lousy 
comedy movies that have perfectly good sound and in modern times is a hundred times better and in fact the tramp is a creature of silent film and part of chaplin's brilliance was physical comedy i mean jim carrey is probably one of the better versions but he still can't hold a candle to to chaplin uh what chaplin could do with his body he didn't need to talk uh, and and the number and the laughs he can get just through body movement which carrey kind of has you know, is an apprentice of Chaplin. And because and, Carey doesn't talk a whole lot either. He's not a comedian of speech so much as expression and gesture. So Jim Carrey in some of his, in some of his movies, like Ace Ventura and so on, is a, is a throwback to silent slapstick. I mean, there's plenty of dialogue, but it doesn't matter. Um, you, you, could, you could almost watch Ace Ventura without the sound and it would be funny. Although he does have, you know, some verbal, like, you know, all the righty then, or whatever, his various tick, verbal ticks. And the Marx Brothers were very verbal, and but they came after Chaplin. The Marx Brothers it were brilliant exploiting sound with their rapid comedy, which Chaplin said, yeah, it, he found them, he, he recognized the talent of the Marx Brothers, but he said their movies sort of frightened him. And I can see that because the Marx Brothers are going a mile a minute. I mean, just joke, 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 pun, pun, pun. And they're amazing, but there's four of them. They're, they're never not moving. So it's a different, very different feeling. Um, there's something balletic about the way Joplin pretty much destroys the, uh, the factory. So that opening shot, first it shows the clock, and then it gives us one of the title cards, Modern Times, a story of industry, of individual enterprise, humanity crusading in the pursuit of happiness. But we, we want to notice that, first of all, it's called modern times. It's not called times. This is about now. This is about what this class has been talking about, what is different and unique about the 20th and now the 21st century. And that is, in it, one of them is that industry is first. It's, he doesn't, humanity is in the middle of this sentence. Happiness is the last word. It's been, instead of a story of happiness um, for humanity, um, despite the um, isolation effect of industry. You know, I, if I read this sentence backwards, that's how it would read. Everything's been flipped. Everything's been turned around. Um, and this will continue in A11, where we see that the idea that we have an essence and that there exists in a soul or even a cell that comes out of something basic in us that's already there, that gets wiped out as we head into postmodernism and reading Waiting for Godot and some of the other works we'll be reading. Um, existentialism will come into being, which is basically the idea that we don't have an essence before our existence. We have an existence which we then mythologize in, into a fantasy essence so that we can feel like we're developing from the inside out, but we're actually being formed from the outside in. And that is part of the Pepsi myths, it's part of consumption, it's part of commodity culture, it's part of why these men go running after these widgets. I mean, in what way is that self-expression? Um, it's not. It's, it's they've been in, in, uh, sort of uh, inoculated by the by the system um, to to do its uh, biddings, encoded. Um, and, you know, we live more, we live by the algorithm more than the, the metaphor now. And a lot of what passes for reality is, is really um, the manipulation of information and not, a, it's not a lived reality. Yeah, we're told what our reality is and then we adapt and, and we mistake adaptation for living. Adaptation requires living, um, but living doesn't have to be adaptation. And the tramp doesn't adapt to anything ever. Uh, there's no way to get to him somehow. And it, it's, it's, I mean, it, he was the first superstar in, in the world. He traveled all over the world. When, when he went to Paris uh, shortly, and, and his movies, there was no sound. So there was no language barrier. Uh, cinema could be, he was beloved in every country in the world that had a cinema. And and they and there weren't even there was no real necessity for um, you know translations or, or dubbing or any of this stuff. Uh, and when he touched down in Paris, where he did some touring, trying to see if he could ease the tensions of Europe, which we saw in Good Morning Midnight, and of course he was not able to. But uh, some sixty thousand people met his airplane at the Paris airport. Sixty thousand people who had a, felt a personal connection to him because they'd seen the mass production of 
his movies. And that's the other amazing thing about cinema is, is it, it's a ma it's mass produced for mass consumption, but it's actually about the difficulties of living in a world that is either the deprivation of mass production or the compensation of mass consumption. So movies are another commodity, but they're about commodity culture often, certainly modern times is. So you go, so the movies make money and Chaplin was a multimillionaire, um, one of the richest people in Hollywood for sure. And, and one of the richer people in, in the United States, um, I mean, there weren't Bill Gates and those kind of people yet. So, and, and he knew his worth, Chaplin, so that when Chaplin first arrived in Hollywood, uh, often actors weren't even given names in the movies. Uh, they, they would just churn out these 10 minute slapstick comedies, Keystone Cops and, uh, the very notion of slapstick indicates how um, we like to see it, as modernity becomes more and more chaotic and you get a lot of chaotic scenes in this movie. We go to the movies to, to see chaos turned into comedy. And that's what slapstick is, whether you're getting banged on the head or uh, have, getting hit in the face with a ladder. It's like it's Home Alone kind of reverts to slapstick. And if you think about it, it's like, why am I enjoying this movie? That guy just took an on uh, the iron in the face. Uh, what's funny about that? I mean, it is funny. That movie was was funny, and but it was funny in a kind of horrific way. Um, the fact that we were laughing at people falling through trap doors and uh, slipping on marbles and getting burned and getting concussions. Uh, partly, it's, a, it's almost a projection. We'd rather see it happen to someone else. Um, I mean, the roller coaster. It was invented around the same time as cinema. And often a movie will, will say, wow, that was, it takes you on a real roller coaster ride. So cinema and roller coasters are both trying to manufacture thrills that are contained because we don't feel in control anymore. The, the modern world is not thrilling. It's, it's terrifying. And we're, we're protecting ourselves against it all the time. And we long for an entertainment where we can, be, you know, have a, a thrill and an excitement uh, without getting killed or without getting uh, hurt. So rollicking movies and roller coasters, uh, loop-de-loops, um, it, it's, it's a strange way to worship the very machine that is confining us. I mean, you get, you get strapped into a roller coaster and you think you're in charge. I mean, try and steer a roller coaster. You, you can't steer a movie either. The movie's already done. You're very, you're passive. You're sitting in front of it. Um, and it happens to you. You don't make it happen. So increasingly that, that passivity is getting worked into every aspect of life. E even social relations are becoming exchange relations. Um, so with the exception of the gammon and the tramp, we don't really see any, what I would call genuinely human interactions. I mean, the president takes his pill from that lady, does it, and then he just stares at his monitor and and then he says, uh, you know, belt number five, speed it up. This is how you get more labor. I mean, those people are paid per hour. So if they do, if they tighten 100 bolts an hour for $10 and they, they increase the speed of the belt, uh, they double the speed of the belt, they're now tightening 200 bolts for, for $10. So in a way, their salary has just been cut in half and they're not, um, they won't see that profit. This is how you turn uh, labor that you extract from the body of the worker into capital. The, the difference between capital and money is capital is money that makes money. Capital is what happens when you get interest for, um, uh, for the, your, your money gets interest. And we're very much in a capitalist economy now where the only, the only big money makers are people who make money with money. Um, uh, no, it's very hard to make money, make a ton of money by just um, by working in a store. Uh, I, I'm sort of a, a part of the, the 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 cultural industry. The university is another industry. It's another factory. Um, it, it's it, you know you guys are passing by me. In, in, in if, if I made the metaphor crass enough, it's like you're passing by me and I'm tightening the bolt on on the top of your head. I'm giving you a lecture and uh, and then you you continue out the door and uh you're not turned into a commodity that gets sold but you pay tuition and i get a salary um and I, but i don't own the university at the same time i'm 
and I think all of you know this on some level, you probably wouldn't be in university. I'm not, I'm not easily replaceable. And, and by that, I don't mean I'm, I'm so amazing as how could anyone replace me? But, you know, people with doctorates are not uh, a dime a dozen. Same with a medical doctor or, uh, um, you know, some of the most popular grad schools that you guys go to is med school, law school, and pharmacy school, because all of those require credential. Cred credentialing is a way to make yourself non-substitutable, or at least not easily substitutable. Obviously, there's other pharmacy. Once you've got your pharmacy degree, other people have pharmacy degrees, but you don't. You can't just swing a cat and hit one of them. So they can't just look up and say, "I don't like your hairstyle." They, you know, you're fired. To tell the tell whoever's hanging out in front of the place that they're the new pharmacist, or they're the new doctor, or they're the new lawyer, or they're the new English professor. Um, I mean, in some ways, I'm on slightly thin ice because a lot of people think anybody can teach English. Uh, and whereas the not people would say, well, not everyone can teach chemistry. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I think anybody can stand up there and talk about books. Um, but is it interesting? Is it enlightening? That's not so easy. That takes some talent and it also takes a lot of work. I can't even, I don't even know how many books I've read. It's, it's probably, God. I don't know, 50,000? And seriously, I don't, I never kept track of it, but I've seen thousands of movies. I've read thousands and thousands of books. I've written two books. I've written 60 different articles, you know, I, so I've just, I'm immersed in this for, and that isn't something they can get by just putting out a want ad saying we, we, lecture hall with 400 students waiting for someone, why don't you walk in? And I don't get paid by the hour. I get a salary and there's expectations for me, but I'm, they can't speed up. Well, I take that back. The way they speed up the assembly line at university, and if we're not careful, is they keep letting classes get bigger. So it's true that I've let A11 and A10 go to 400 students, and that's because that's how many students want to take it. But I've always insisted that I have at least an hour and a half of grading help per student. Um, and if they're not willing to increase the budget for grading your work, I won't, uh, I won't teach above that number, even though I'm happy to let you guys in. Otherwise, I'd get work to death. You know, they would say, I'd have my salary, and I'd have, I'd have a class of 30, and I'd do all the grading. And the next semester, I'd go in there, and there would be 60 of you. That would be the equivalent of doubling the, the conveyor belt, because uh, now I'd be grading 60 essays for the same amount of money as when I was grading 30 essays. And there's potentially, you know, unchecked, there's no limit. And they could be like, now your class is 90. Now your class is 120. And if you don't like it, there's some, there's probably just somebody behind you that's unemployed and desperate. Um, and we'll, um, we'll do it, we'll step in for you. Um, so I have seniority and my salary has gone up over the years and I have tenure, which means that I really can't be fired except for gross criminal negligence or something. I, uh, I'm not even sure. It would, it would have to be a crime, I think. Uh, I could, certainly a dumb lecture won't get me fired, but a bad day at work in another kind of job could. You go to McDonald's and, and having a bad day and you yell at a customer, you can turn in your apron, you know, right there, you're done. Um, so that's the kind of um, pressure uh, uh, that that uh, we're under. So the central thing to remember about Chaplin's tramp, and, and by extension, uh, the girl, is he's homeless as far as we know, consistently unemployed in between brief periods of, of employment, and is never shown to have any money, or to actually exchange money for anything. He only has social relation, which is the very thing modernity is monetizing and stamping out. So as such, he brings a pre-modern sensibility directly into the scenes of relentlessly depicted uh, modern times. Um, and then, so I mentioned the two, sh the sheep shot followed by the men coming up out of the subway. And uh, the way that, you know, even a subway is, you saw this in Good Morning Midnight, you know, which way is the exit, Sasha keeps saying, and, and the steel finger keeps pointing and says this way to the exhibition. So it's not just in the factory where people are sorted and organized. The minute they get up in the morning, they, they got to walk to a subway stop and they go down underground into a tube like a straw. Um, then they can't see anything. They're underground and they, they're not steering the subway. Um, the subway is going to prescribed stops, well, one of which would certainly include 
a proximity to a many to a major factory or a major department store. Uh, so they're not they're they are still like sheep in a way. They're they're being herded by the subway system. And then they the next shot they're in the hallway and they have to punch their card and put it in slot. And then they have to go in and stand before their stations um, and, and prepare uh, for the day. So you go from a shot of them coming up the subway to a shot of them all heading uh, toward the factory and uh, lining up there too, this is several crowd scenes. And then we jump to the president who's all alone um, in his office and it's a bit jarring because it's very crowded. Every shot has been very, very crowded, people pressing up against each other, giant crowd and then boom, this big office uh, with a lit ceiling and the gigantic TV screen in the back uh, and his little machine. And he is doing a jigsaw puzzle uh, because he doesn't, his, he, his labor is to extract labor from workers' bodies and transform it into capital. Uh, and as long as he does that, he'll get his bonus. I mean, that's why CEOs uh, have be, seem to have become the new titans of our of our time um they, they can make so much money and it's not you can't tell me that that you know making they make 40 billion dollars because that's the worth they bring to humanity i mean i'm not even complaining about the ceos i don't i i wish they would distribute their wealth to people who need it but other than i don't have anything personal against the ceos but i do uh, I do refuse this mythology that they're worth $50 billion and that's why they get $50 billion. Just like I, re I reject the mythology that anybody is only worth what they, how much money they make. And I, just as I've told you, I, would, I reject that you are your grade point average. Um, that you got, in fact, I, you know, I've got people, uh, I have students who get, got 3.0, uh, in my class, uh, because in their first year, or, or even in some cases, dropped out or even flunked, and they're professors. I mean, they took other classes of mine. They got interested. They worked. They went to. They got their masters. They got their PhD. They got a job. They're they're now English professors. So I know firsthand that um, your your GPA is not your destiny. Um, it it can help, but it it actually is way less powerful than than it's positioned as being. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it might get you into this grad school rather than that one, and this one's quote unquote better, but you still have your life to live. You still have to do whatever you do. And uh, if you're driven and motivated enough and driven, like Harvard doesn't make you smart. But, and, and if you're smart, you can go to a community college and, uh, and become you know, brilliant at at what you do. So these institutions act like they bestow these qualities on us, but in fact, they just organize us and, uh, and in many cases, extract resources from us. Um, and even this class, hopefully my lectures help you, uh, but you're going to be able to look at Dorian Gray again for yourself. You don't need me. Um, I mean, one student the other day, <laughs> he did say, I, I wish Professor Leonard could be made into an app. <laughs> so, so I could walk down the street and see a billboard and and then I could just uh, open up the app and Professor Leonard would tell me what what the myth of progress is in the billboard, which I thought was pretty cute. And if I guess if I was um, Bill Gates, maybe I'd monetize that, sell myself as, as an app, the Gary Leonard app, you know, never be bored looking at advertisements again or anything else. Um, so. Uh, also, this is a, this is an easy to miss detail. Um, although I think I caught it in my stills, it's, it's he's reading the paper and the comic strip on the back of the paper is Tarzan, and Tarzan was written by Edgar Rice Burroughs in 1914, right right after the horrors of the war. It show, showed how fragile the masculine body was, and he came up with one of the great myths of 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 a time where masculinity was seen as increasingly fragile, you know, chewed up by machine guns and unemployment and mass production. So he comes up with a story of a, of a man who gets dropped, a baby, in fact, who gets dropped into the middle of the jungle, um, becomes king of the apes, fights lions, uh, you know, just uh, does, it, and then goes back and finds out he's a duke or, or an earl and meets Jane, um, who at first is like, you know, am I supposed to be interested in this smelly guy in a loincloth, but 
Yes, because somehow he's still civilized in, innately, even though he's been raised by by apes, and uh, and he becomes an effective uh, aristocrat back in England. So th this this is a compensatory fantasy that no matter what happens to you, your qualities as a gentleman uh, will eventually emerge and put you in your proper place. Um, our superheroes of today are still based on that Tarzan model. Even even someone like uh, Tony Stark, Iron Man is particularly interesting because his superpowers are, are technology, um, his heart and his ability to fly around. And uh, it, it makes the technology appear to be something that, I mean, you could read Iron Man a different way, which is that this is, this is a desperately fragile man. And, 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 I, and usually in the plot, somebody steals his heart or whatever at some point. And so he's presented as a Superman superhero, but he's actually this super fragile guy who'll die in minutes without all the machinery around him. He might, he might as well be on a ventilator. Um, and, and yet that's presented to us as, as, uh, as, a, as a hero. Um, and, uh, you know, the Incredible Hulk is, is a way to uh, convert someone with an anger management problem in, uh, also into uh, a superpower, uh, rage as a superpower. So our cinemas are, are absolutely, were before COVID at least, they were stuffed with uh, superhero movies. Uh, and and you can't even, it's even getting unusual to have a movie about just one superhero. You know, just Superman. Uh, there was the Batman franchise for a while, and the Joker in the the, the famous depiction by Heath Ledger, which which really was astonishing. Um, Heath Ledger is like is is like the evil tramp. Um, he's, he's like Chaplin's tramp figure, but with all of his humanity um, uh, completely perverted, because he doesn't care about money either. In in that's in, in the Batman show you know he steals all his money shoots all the people who helped him steal it and then burns the money uh he, he and, and he does weird experiments like the two boats you know where, where they have to figure out who's going to push the detonator it, it he's he also throws a wrench into the system he blows up a hospital and so on but he's but he's doing it out of a, out of a, a pain and, a, and a, a, a painfulness that has produced psychosis which you know we get his backstory in the more recent Joaquin uh phoenix uh, I got that right. Um, also an extraordinary performance of, of, you know, who the Joker was before he became the Joker. And it's all trauma. It's all pain. It's all neglect and abuse. Uh, and that's superheroes are compensations for trauma. I mean, Batman saw his parents shot to death right in front of him. Spider-Man saw his, his uncle die right there on the sidewalk. And, you know, and he got his, got his famous thing with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, uh, all these superheroes are, are forged out of trauma. Iron Man, all the rest of them, uh, Wonder Woman, and so on. So they are trauma reaction formations that are so apparently so successful. I mean, Septimus should be a superhero. He, he, he should come back. And, and Superman, by the way, the comic strip Superman was written in 1933, just three years before this movie. And Batman, first Batman comic is 1937, a year after this movie. So the super, what, what we now recognize as superheroes are invented at the same time that this movie is being produced. And we can see why, because these men are not superheroes. And they're looking desperately for something to compensate them for this incredible helplessness, uh, the, the passivity. And the scene where the father of the gammon just puts his head in his hands. I mean, how awful is it to see your children hungry? Um, and the gammon, also in a more fierce way than the tramp, she she refuses to accept the dictates of capitalist culture. Um, she's hungry, she sees bananas. She not only, you know, grabs a banana, peels it and bites into it and looking kind of feral and wild, she, she stays there and starts cutting bananas and throwing them to all the hungry children who are dancing up and down watching her until someone finally chases her off and then she brings home a big armful to her, uh, to her, uh, to her father. And in a way, the same thing with the bread. I mean, she d doesn't see, she's not going to starve when there's a bakery with, and, a, and a truck full of food. And this is the, this is the uh, kind of visual cruelty of capitalist democracy is that you can starve looking through a plate glass window um, at, at the food you need. Uh, I mean, I, yes, we, we 
to some degree have food banks and so on. But there's democracy is it showed like the department store. You can go look at stuff all day. And remember Sasha when she was like, oh, my God, if I'd only had that black dress, this wouldn't be happening to me. So people are window shopping now. In fact, plate glass had been invented in 1902 and just be just at the beginning of the great department stores, the, the Bon Marché in Paris being one of the, of the first. Plate glass was a glass that permitted the kind of glass we see outside of Holt Renfrew now. There was no window shopping before plate glass because a glass couldn't be more than about a foot, but one foot by one foot or whatever that is in meters. I'm betraying my, my US origins here. Um, so now plate glass can be 20 feet high and 50 feet wide. So, so now you can set up a tableau and check out old Renfrew's, you know, or go to Macy's uh, Fifth Avenue is famous for during Christmas for these unbelievably amazing window displays, these tiny little utopic worlds, of, but all made out of commodities. We, we literally get a visual and they look like cinema too. It's like you're, it's like a movie screen, there's a little train going by and Santa's waving and children just, you know, like, Wow, they're just eyes as big as saucers. Um, and, uh, you know, so if we're surrounded by excessive consumption, whether we have money or not, and the good news is excessive consumption doesn't make you happy the way that excessive consumption claims, but because it claims that so well, people who are poor, uh, if they don't, this is one reason I'm trying to point this out to you guys, is you can make they can feel terrible. Like I would have had a good life, but I wasn't able to buy that stuff in in uh, the window of whole Renfrew. That would not have given you a good. You can have a good life without all that stuff, and you can have a crappy life with it. I mean, that's that's. I mean, who are we seriously think that there aren't any such thing as unhappy rich people? And I sometimes wonder if there are any that are happy. I, uh, did Trump look happy? He's, he's been surrounded in one way or another by money and luxury his whole life and i've never seen anybody so angry sad and depressed um like an addict i mean he really does look like a, a, an addict who's just going for the next fix and, and in between this has a haggard face and and a desperate lurch um so then we get the after his pill the guy uh turns on the surveillance system and this brings in a whole nother issue that where, where Chaplin's a you know, brilliant prophet. I mean, he, he shows us so much. This is going to get worse that the factory and the department store and the jails and the, even the insane asylums. The insane asylum is, is the flip side of the factory because the point of the insane asylum is to quote unquote cure you. But what does a cure mean? A cure means that you're cured enough so you can go back and stand in the assembly line. They, sent you into to depression in the first place. Nobody's cured. And there's, a, there's an amazing scene there where the, he's shown shaking the hand of the doctor. And the doctor says, uh, just take it easy and don't get too excited. And then, and then we get this montage of cars going by and, and it's chaos. And uh, it, it's, 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 you know, feeling anxious and depressed. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe it's modernity. Maybe being anxious and depressed is an inevitable, um, authentic reaction. Uh, uh, I mean, anxiety and depression are often attempts to mask a truth that you're afraid to accept. And we, if you don't want to accept that the modern world is chaotic and random uh, a lot, most of the time, like Matthew Arnold's concept, nature has now become, the city has become nature and uh, nature's become data. Um, we're surrounded by information as though it were forest. And we're constantly exploring the information and trying to process the information like they were trees or something. Um, and the result is that, you know, if we, if, if we feel that, if we feel modernity authentically, it'll feel like we're suddenly being crushed by 50,000 pounds per square inch. And the problem is nobody wants to admit it. So when somebody loses their job, I mean, they get sympathy, but Nobody ever challenges the system, really. Um, they because in many ways we're all the, the, at this point the ideology of modernity is is a is a drug we all to a certain extent take, um, and we're afraid not to, and we're always told you know uh, 
where to, if Wall Street is doing well, then everything's fine. There's no connection between Wall Street and working people. No, they don't have investments in that. And it, it's, it's really a bit of a myth because when corporations make tons of money, they don't go out and hire more people. They don't go out and raise the salary. When's the last time Bezos raised the salary of, of his workers in the Amazon uh, factories? I mean, the damn thing is even called the Amazon, talking of speaking of jungles. And he's got $60 billion. He doesn't know what to do except launch cars into space. And he keeps saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It's like, it's not rocket science, dude, although you seem to think it is. Why don't you, you find a way to redistribute? Uh, you, you don't even know how many billions you have. You're not even able to spend it before you die. So, uh, you know, and, and then he, oh, I don't think I finished my Walmart story, or, or did I? But they put out a barrel, at, yeah, asking the employees to donate toys to the employees. How about giving them a bonus? So they can go buy toys. How the, what, you're asking all the poor people to pool their meager resources, then when no one has enough to begin with, and and you think, and Walmart thinks they're actually doing something charitable. It, it was madness. Um, and when you read against the grain of modernity, it's it's sometimes it's shocking how quickly it you, it looks crazy. Um, Samuel Beckett will say the guy in Godot in A11. He said the the uh, the challenge for the artist is to present the chaos for what it is and not pretend that it's something else. And Chaplin's an artist and he does that. He does not pretend the chaos is something else. They, what we think is the highly organized world of modernity is actually chaos. And the effect on us um, is that internally we feel chaotic, but we don't connect it to the, the effect of the chaotic world we're we're living in, where this this clock culture, and now this surveillance culture. Um, if any of you have ever done telemarketing, or you know how how much, some of you guys probably know something about this, depending on what kind of summer jobs you've had. But surveillance cameras, obviously, I mean, we're, we are beginning to surveil ourselves. Like we buy the Ring thing from Amazon, we buy Alexa, so so that you know she can send information, which they claim is somehow separated from who we actually are, or maybe it is, but what's happened is that the only form of existence that capitalism recognizes is that of the consumer. Like if you're not consuming, you don't exist in capitalism. And that is, and obviously you, you do exist, but capitalism is not interested in anything else except you using your existence to produce and consume in a pattern of uh, compensation deprivation, which is endless and bottomless and addictive. It, it's an addiction model. Uh, so the culture of surveillance is ferocious now. Facebook and Google are monitoring our clicks, Alexa reporting our conversations, which are mostly mine to figure out how to stimulate desire for newly manufactured commodities in order to keep commodity culture endlessly prompting the mass consumption of the products of mass production. Because the problem, is, of course, we know a lot about the history of mass production. We call it the industrial revolution. We don't, one of the things I do in my work is trying to give you the history of mass consumption because somebody has to consume all this stuff that they're making. That's why advertising is so important and so revealing. And everyone doesn't think it matters. They, they write whole books about the latest machine, who, but that machine isn't gonna be worth a damn if you can't sell what it makes. And if what it makes is lipstick and it can make 50 million tubes of lipstick in a year, you gotta sell 50 million tubes of lipstick and you're not gonna do that. Um, by saying, hey, look, isn't it pretty? It's red. No, you're going to do it by calling it infallible and showing a woman putting it on while three men are staring at her um, with, with clearly wanting to you know, turn their salaries over to her. And uh, uh, that's you know, you, you, the way you sell. Advertising doesn't sell the product. Advertising connects what you fear you lack in your life and then tries to position the product as the thing that will fill that hole. So first it creates a hole in you and then it offers you something to fill it. Um, when I was growing up, maybe still the soap commercials you were laundry commercials were always sold on the premise that your family will love you more if their if their laundry smells nice. So one of the ads I remember is the boy comes up to his mother and says, Why do why did Bobby's towels smell better than our towels? Because he the kid had, had a sleepover. And and I'm sitting there thinking, well, first of all, what the hell is this you're doing in the linen closet? I, you know, I thought you were on a play date. Um, you're in there sniffing towels, and now you're sniffing my towels, and, and you expect me to feel bad because you have a 
problem with towels, you, you, you know, need therapy. Um, or Mr. Clean just shows up in your kitchen. It's like, this place is a dump. And, and you're just like, oh, hi, big six foot scary white bald guy I've never seen before. You're right, I'm, I'm a terrible housekeeper. Uh, and he's like, well, don't worry about it. Just buy my Mr. Clean juice and, um, and then you can, you know, I'll give you back your self-worth. Um, so in this case, the mother looked crushed when, when, uh, when the kid said, you know, these towels smell bad. And so of course she switches to downy fabric softener and the kid buries his head in the towels and says, I love you, mom. And I'm thinking, you know, you, know, you love her because you know, were you getting high on these towels? I mean, that's not why you love someone. Uh, um, if you didn't love them before huffing the towel, you know, it, 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 <laughs> it's not. Authentic. Um, so let's see, I'm, I want to keep moving along. As I said, I have all these stills with little paragraphs under all of them. And then I'm kind of glancing at them as I, as I go, but I'm trying to, uh, to kind of perform the, the, the lecture uh, material as well. So, um, you know, uh, Orwell said, uh, Big Brother is watching you. And when he, when he did his dystopia of surveillance culture, but it turns out Big Brother is us watching. We, we Big Brother ourselves. We, watch, we go on Facebook, we see our image, we see other people's image on Instagram, on Snapchat, on TikTok, and uh, we surveil our self-worth based on all these images that everybody's posting, but they're, they're all virtual. It's all, they're not genuine social relations. I, I have no problem with these platforms, except that they're replacing social relations. I would, I don't mind, I mean, I have a Facebook. Uh, I don't feel a big connection to it other than sharing funny things, sending photos to my family. Um, but I don't care how many likes I get or if I never get any likes. And, and that's partly because I'm not a digital native, probably. Um, I wonder, maybe some of you saw that Black Mirror uh, production. Black Mirror was a pretty interesting series and, and I could definitely teach one or two of those Black Mirror episodes in, in relation to modern times. But the, the one I'm thinking of is one where this, you know, people get obsessed with how many likes they get and you have to have a certain amount of likes to go to, to parties. And, and we watched the rise and fall of this woman who, again, it looks like an addict that uh, she gets a few lucky breaks and her social rating goes super high and she finally gets into the most elite parties of all. And then a few things go wrong and her likes start disappearing. And then now we've got cancel culture, which I don't even totally understand for myself because you, you can cancel me all you want on, uh, on the internet. I don't care. I don't live there, but some people do. Um, and certainly, so, and, I, and I don't mean to be glib about this because cyberbullying really suggests how much our moods now, are, are dependent on this surveillance culture's approval or disapproval of us. So to cyber bully someone, to you know, post a, a photo naked of them, which is probably the ultimate revenge porn, uh, uh, it's probably the worst possible form of cyber bullying, but there, there are a lot of others that are, uh, and the problem with cyber bullying is that it's not new. People have bullied before, but you had to do it in person. You had to see the look on the face of the person you just threw to the ground. And it took a little more effort to think that what you'd just done was a nut was admirable. Um, but now you can put the worst, put some totally snarky comment, really nasty comment that you know is not true. And, and it's going to, you know, is going to make somebody cry or feel awful or not want to come to school the next day. And you can just snicker and turn away. You don't see them. You don't see their face. You don't uh, see how that made them feel. And, and other people aren't there either to say, like on a schoolyard to say, Hey, Bob, why don't you leave the kid alone? Why don't you pick on someone your own size? So, uh, you, you can get into some, you know, really serious, um, and, and it's not just, it's, it's psychological bullying, obviously, because you, you can't push someone off the swings on the internet, but you can make them feel like all the ways that they try and make themselves feel valuable are now saying that they're worthless. And you can, if you can do that seamlessly and effectively to the point where it's really dangerous and, and, and even can move someone toward suicidal ideation. Um, so, uh, Let's see what else I want to get to here. Um, let's see, yeah, let me go down a little bit. Okay, so the eating machine. 
Now, the you'll notice in this movie that one of the ways that um, Chaplin pushes back against the the increase of machine culture is that this in in a, the the food. There's, there's almost there's so much food in this movie. There's so many scenes uh, with food, and that's that not just the eating machine, but the bread that gets stolen, uh, the restaurant where he goes and eats and then tells the cop to pay for it, the candy to the kids. Uh, there's the, the even in his fantasy house, the cow comes and and gives him a, a, a pitcher of milk and then ambles off and he's got an orange tree outside his window. Because food, so eating, being hungry um, is uh, is not a mechanical thing. Machines don't eat. People do. And so one of the markers of how much we're being asked to be machines is how much are they messing with our need to eat? We all know that lunch hours can can get squeezed in. I mean, you know, what the hell is fast food? Is it food that can the Usain Bolt hamburger? It's not fast that way. It's fast in the sense that you can get it and it's within five minutes and you can eat it in another 10. We don't seem to realize how much pressure we're allowing to be put on ourselves that we let our lunch be shrunk to to 10 minutes and it's and it's not always high quality food it can be really high in fat and salt and it doesn't it tastes pretty good and, and i'm not trying to put mcdonald's out of business but don't eat there every night or if you, or if you want to watch the movie called supersize me and then you won't want to it's a documentary about a guy who lived on mcdonald's and gained 300 pounds not pretty but it does you know it does give you the willpower to, to skip the big mac um so, you know, in France, for instance, they fought back on this hard. Lunch hour is kind of sacred in Paris. It's, it has to be at least an hour, if not an hour and a half. They they they, they do not want to eat at their desks. Uh, food is life to the French and to the Parisians. And, and they're not wrong. I mean, you know, we just had, we had Thanksgiving here. The U.S. just had their Thanksgiving. It's all based around food. Food and social relations are inextricable because you actually chew, you taste, you eat, you smell, you touch, you comment on all of that. And then, and then you may mention how Bobby's doing in school or whatever, but the, the food is is what has brought you together. And then you share, you know, try some of this pie and, or you, and you bring some muffins. And it's, uh, it's the essence of, of full social relations. So the, the food, um, in, in but machines and and production don't care about it. in fact it's a problem you, you, we could make more money if, if workers didn't have to stop to eat so the, the enter the food machine and it's it's going to feed you so you don't even get a break from the machine it'll shove food in your mouth it's a very funny scene and it's also again kind of frightening and um, one of my favorite things about it is the way that as the food gets more aggressive, and it's not the food that's aggressive, it's, it's the machine, and it starts pushing metal bolts into his mouth because the guy had in, inadvertently put the bolts on the same plate as, uh, as the little dessert, I think it's dessert. And after the chaos of the food being pushed at him and thrown in his face, um, this silly little napkin just very elegantly, and that's compensation. It, it very elegantly comes over and wipes his mouth and very carefully goes back, and he, he looks at it, you know, it's almost with the, and then the corn smacks him in the face again, and then the mashed potatoes are thrown at him, and and and, and it's only at the last, it's only when the napkin thing goes out of control, that he's literally knocked to the ground, because so, finally even the napkin goes aggressive and it just starts smacking him in the face. It's not wiping his lips anymore, and then that's when he falls to the ground, and that's when the owner says, uh, no, it's no good, not because it's just beat up my worker, but because it doesn't work. It's not practical. I'm, this guy's obviously not going to be able to keep working while food is thrown at him and a sponge smacks him in the face. Um, and it's shortly after that that he has his psychotic episode, if, if you want to call it that. But really, the psychotic episode shows that the human, when a human dances in a factory, um, the, the factory shuts down because the factory is in that sense, is, is anti-human. It's anti-humanist. So he, he doesn't just wreck things, he dances. And his the machinery breaks down around his dance, which, and the, the inverse is also true, that what, what, is, what is balletic about the human condition breaks down inside the machine. And they, they're not compatible. Um, 
and so either you, you know, cultivate your humanity and machinery has nothing to do with that, or your humanity gets stamped out of you by a machine that neither recognizes nor has any use for. Um, there's a funny scene where he starts tightening buttons and we, and we realize that, you know, his work has been reduced to such a sharp point um, that that he he doesn't feel like he's building anything uh, and and he's been hypnotized if you will to the point where he wants to tighten buttons on women's clothing um, and then this cured of a nervous breakdown but without a job he leaves the hospital to start life anew and then he walks take it easy and avoid excitement he walks through the, the constant chaos um, and it's important to note that the tramp never resents modernity it's another thing that, that he doesn't did why he doesn't break i mean septimus with good reason you know resents the 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 human brood with the red nostrils and but it's part of what's exhausting him and it's part of what drives him out the window um whereas I, there's nothing remotely suicidal about the tramp it doesn't seem to ever occur to him why the hell would he kill himself why would he even feel bad about himself he hasn't done anything wrong and he's so convinced of that that it, that it gives him a certain immunity um, he simply refuses to get any self-worth from the, the the process of production and consumption. He's not a part of it. Um, and he, he neither gets deprived nor compensated. Neither one works. He just is. And and the gammon is the same way. When they've got it, they share it. When they don't, they look after each other. Uh, it's that simple. The tramp never resents modernity. He just experiences it as a bizarre interruption of his natural tendency to be humane, empathetic, sympathetic, and compassionate. And it's as if the city and its institutions are now the monstrous representations of Dorian Gray's sociopathology and the Congo's genocidal exploitive efficiency. By refusing to resist the machine or to take it seriously, the tramp is able to avoid internalizing its rhythms and becoming a slave to it. He never enters the matrix, so he doesn't have to be pulled from it. And I just read one of my notes, so you can see how good they are. Um, so he's fine in jail. In fact, he wants to go back to jail. It makes sense. He doesn't have to work. And he, he helps with the robbers because he, he likes the institution. So that's you know why these people, I don't think he understands why they're trying to escape. And then we have the bread scene, which I've, uh, uh, I've uh, already covered. Um, the department store scene shows that excess of luxury, which is very cold and very, I mean, it's the gammon and the tramp that bring life to the objects, whereas the idea supposedly is the objects will bring life to you, the, the new main coat, the beautiful bed. But the gammon actually seems overwhelmed in this setting. She seems almost extinguished by it. And she gets lively again when she finds that rundown shack and because she wants to experience life and not be told what her life is by the advertisements and the objects that she surrounds herself with. Um, the final scene in the where Chaplin is the singing waiter is, is, is a very elaborate homage to the end of silent film that this will be the last time the world will see the tramp he's retiring the tramp which has been he's been making movies with the tramp in them for 20 years it's the most recognized popular figure in the world and now it's over because the tramp can't translate into uh sound films he's not about dialogue so and yet everybody was when they heard the Chaplin movie was coming out, they were like, oh my God, we're gonna hear Chaplin speak. So he toys with that. And we think we're finally gonna hear him sing, and it, but he only sings one line and then the, the cuffs where the lyrics are written fly off and he doesn't have any words. And this is his final sort of, you know, F you to the silent, to the sound film. Cause he's, he then delivers this, this hilarious pantomime, which is much more effective than words. Um, he can imitate it. He can make you look like he's driving a taxi. He can make you look like he's in a bedroom drawing a window blind. He switches roles from uh, a, a sort of gold digger woman to a fat old guy who's trying to get her, try, uh, trying to get her, and but she wants to marry, get married first before she'll go to bed with him. And it's clear as day, um, much more than if he'd just sung lyrics and we just listened to words. He's he tells the story with his body and uh you know that that art as i mentioned jim carrey but it but it isn't there's this misconception that that movies before sound i think i just said this but let me see if i can reiterate it that 
they're, they're masterpieces. There are so many silent movies that are as good and better than the very, very best movies you've ever seen in your life. You, they're, but they're masters, like The Last Laugh is absolutely a masterpiece. It's beautiful. It's, you can watch it over and over. I can watch silent movies over and over more than sound movies sometimes because, you know, you know the next line of dialogue and it's like, la, la, la. Whereas silent movies, the images, the, the framing, the cuts, the, the, the movements, they're, they're so beautiful that it's like watching a, a living painting. Okay, um, and then the last scene, which is very famous, the, the gammon finally seems depressed because she had to run away from yet another job. I mean, she was actually working and they wanted to bring, bring her to an orphanage as a vagrant. It, that literally doesn't make sense. She was paying her own way, but the institution is, they get so bound up in their rules that they don't even, it's not a social relation. I, I mean, even the owner of the restaurant's like, what the hell are you doing? I'm, I'm, she's got a job but as long as she wants it. And they just show him a piece of paper that says wanted for vacancy. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, okay, I guess so. It's stupid. And uh, so, of course, they outwit the, the cops and they, they run away. And, but, but so unfair, you know, because he's got a job now. And it, it's, it's funny that, you know, Chaplin doesn't do that last laugh thing. He doesn't give us a contrived happy ending. But he also doesn't leave them, you know, wrecked and broken because that hasn't been the point the whole movie. They have this incredible spirit. They're trying to get by. Uh, they kind of remind me of Jim and Pam in the office. Uh, it's sort of, sort of finishing up like, uh, season nine or something, which has been a little insane ever since Michael left that show. But, um, you know, they're the steady ones. Uh, Pam and Jim somehow are living their life, getting married, falling in love, having a baby, dealing. I mean, it, it, when I watch Pam and Jim in the office, it's almost like that's a separate series. Um, they're actually normal people going through dramatic issues. They have real fights that, that feel real. And it's not just constant jokes like Dwight and Angela. Anyway, I don't know how many of you watch The Office. But um, the reason, you know, social relation is an antidepressant. Uh, and lack of social relation is, is not, is, is losing another, uh, is losing a really valuable coping tool. I'm not against antidepressants, by the way. I think properly used, they can be very supportive. They can help you get the most out of your therapy. So this isn't an anti-pharmaceutical thing. Uh, they can be overprescribed as well, obviously, but they, they, you know, well done. They can, they can support you learning the coping skills you need. Uh, but social relations is, a, is an antidepressant without side effects. In other words, sometimes the only thing that's going to help you feel better is sharing. Uh, most of the 12-step programs, Alcoholics Anonymous and so on, they're, they're built around sharing. You know, a room full of strangers. Everybody agrees to anonymity. Um, and then you share. You share your failures as you perceive it, and you share your triumphs and your successes. And... You know, you can listen to a share from someone who's crying and you can listen to a share from someone who's saying, I had, I had such a good week because I figured something out. And you can, you know, go back and forth with that. So there's 12, there's a 12 step programs for, every, for all the addictions because addictions are an attempt to numb depression, among other things, and, and panic and anxiety. So it makes sense that what, what do the groups do that are trying to get you to stop using your substance of choice, like cocaine, alcohol, you know, I could go on and on. And it's community. It's, it's actually talking about your problems. It's very hard to do by yourself because you, your mind is just a gerbil wheel. It just, uh, it goes through the same problem the same way over and over again and until you finally want to drink or uh, something, some kind of substance to just stop this gerbil wheel in your head. But if, but there are other people with gerbil wheels in their head. And if you put them all in the same room, they can share their gerbil wheels and they stop being gerbil wheels um, in, in the positive uh, sense. Okay, so this is the last lecture, uh, sad to say. And, and, and usually I say, you know, I'm going to miss seeing you guys, but I, I never have entirely seen you, um, which kind of sucks. But so I, I'll end the class with... Uh, with a story, because I, I think I've told you that my hope is that despite the final exam, which always makes it sound like you're going to turn in the exam, die, it, it, there is no fight. I mean, and don't misunderstand me. There's a final exam in this class, but there's no final exam in this class. Um, none of these ideas 
that I've presented to you are over because you do your last written thing and turn it in and you get your grade. That's a completely artificial stopping point. This class never ends. I've been teaching it 26 years. I'm not any, don't seem to be any nearer to the end of it. Um, it this is a, it's a ritual in the best sense of the word. We do it over and over again because it, it helps people not do things over and over again. And that's one of the things I've tried to convey, not, not just what's Dorian Gray all about, but what are you all about? So I'll tell you this final story. There once, it's a fairy tale. There once uh, was a king and he had uh, three sons and it was time for them to be married. Um, but the problem was there were only two other kingdoms that had daughters. Uh, so the king said, well, I can't help that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stand, you're gonna come with me. I'm gonna stand at the top of the castle and I have three arrows and I'm gonna shoot each of the three arrows and whoever, uh, picks up the arrow, it will be your bride. So he shoots the first arrow and then the one daughter picks it up and that son trots off. He shoots the second arrow, second daughter picks it up and trots off, shoots the third arrow and it lands in a swamp. And out of the swamp comes a toad, maybe a frog, let's say a frog, uh, with the arrow in its mouth. And the king says, well, you know the rules. Uh, you're going to marry the frog. And so they yeah, had the wedding, you know, frogs on a little pillow, they got married and, and the son is like, well, you know, that's it for my life. And he gets home with the frog and then something amazing happens. Once they're alone in the house, she turns into a beautiful woman. The frog turns into a beautiful, loving, generous woman who, and a great cook and uh, could, couldn't find anyone to make him happier. The problem is that she can only do that. What she does is she unzips a frog skin and puts it in the corner of the house. And then she's this beautiful, loving person that he loves. And they're very, very happy together. And, um, but when she goes back out into public, she has to zip the frog suit back on, um, which bothers him a lot. So he keeps begging her, can, can we please go to the big dance? Because in these stories, it's always a big dance, uh, Cinderella and all the rest of them. Um, some kind of prom fetish, but they, it's always a big dance. And um, he says, would you please just tonight come to the ball as, as you, because my brothers think I'm still married to an amphibian and they laugh at me and I just, my, you're so much nicer and better than their wives. And I just, could you do this for me just tonight, just this once? And she said, okay, all right, I'll do it. it it's I'll, it's going to be kind of tiring, but yeah, I can, I can do it. And then we'll come home after that. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll come home right away. And so they go to the ball and, and his brothers are sick with jealousy and everybody else is like, oh my God, you're the luckiest man in the world. And this guy's enjoying this so much. And then he gets an idea and he sneaks out of the dance and he goes home and he throws her frog skin into the fire and burns her frog skin. And his idea is obviously that now she'll have to just be the beautiful woman all the time. But this is a real fairy tale. This is not Disney. The mice are not going to come in and wash the dishes now. She's going to die. He's, he's in essence has, has it killed the love of his life and the woman who loved him because it became more important to him that others envy him than that he simply enjoyed, like he didn't need them to know or not know to have this loving woman. And so now you're asking yourself, why the hell did he tell that story? What does it have to do with this already depressing class? Well, here's the deal. Don't burn your frog skin. We are, we're all like this lady. We all have a frog skin that we like to leave behind. We don't show it to people. It's what Yates called the rag and bone shop of the heart. But it's also the place he said where all the ladders start, which is the title of our book. I must go down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. That is your, your rag and bone shop is the best thing about you. It's, it's one of the things about modernity. And we saw this right at the beginning with Dorian Gray. The worst thing about modernity is it, it tricks you into thinking that your superficial qualities, which are the parts of you that are not your best 
are what, are all that you should present the, the the Facebook culture, the Dorian Gray culture, and then you get scared about what's in your attic. But what's in your attic is the best thing about you. And no, you don't have to go showing everybody your attic all the time. But don't be don't be afraid of your attic. Don't belittle your attic. And if someone says, "All right, I, uh, you know, don't don't burn the frog skin, don't stab the painting." Um, value your frog skin. Value in in, in it, it's it's what you call your failings that are the essence of your humanity. And machines don't think that way. And increasingly, we're thinking like machines. So we've learned to hate uh, and fear and be ashamed of and guilty of and embarrassed of our best qualities. The, 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 we see them as weakness. Uh, and every time Trump was talk about losers and and how things were weak, uh, and and he's one of the biggest weakest people I've I've ever seen. His his necessity to uh, to strong arm everybody because somewhere in him he's a frightened little boy who was never loved. Uh, he, he burns his frog skin every day, and he's a mess. Uh, I've never seen somebody so angry and so depressed every day. So, if the if there's a moral to this class, it's and then, you know, how do I summarize this class in, in, in this final story? Well, I don't know, I'm doing the best I can, but um, value your frog skin. And literature will help you do that. Great movies will help you. Great paintings, great music. Um, art is really important because art is what introduces us to the best parts of ourselves. You know, come in under the shadow of the red rock. And I'll show you fear in a handful of dust, but you shouldn't be afraid of mortality. It's what makes you, you. Uh, all right. Well, I guess I'm signing off on A10 for like the 50th time. I'm not disappearing. Um, I'm going to have open classroom this Wednesday. Uh, if there's enough interest expressed, I can have open Wednesday, maybe the, maybe the week after that. Uh, I will continue to monitor my email. I'll continue to monitor Quirkus, and I will be posting. I think maybe one more extra point opportunity. I have to. Th I had an idea, the, and, and now I've forgotten it. But it it'll come back to me. Um, so we're still in touch as much as we've ever been virtually, and uh, I will do be doing A11 in the fall. Uh, if you want more of this. Also, I will be doing the guest lecturing in B76, which is the, uh, the film class on, on genres. So there's still room in that class. Uh, and they they have promised that they will match anybody who signs up with, uh, with grading hours so that I'm not overwhelmed. So that I, and there's, I mean, and I think it's capped at 150, although I don't even know what a cap means anymore. Um, and for those of you who do want to take A11 and maybe are on the waiting list, because even though there's 400 people, there's apparently a waiting list, uh, I can, I don't know how many are on the waiting list and I don't know how many who are or want, want to get in. But if you're on the waiting list, don't just walk away. Send me an email. Tell me I'm, I'm on the waiting list, but I really want to take this class because I can call the administrator in the English department and they will add any student I tell them to. Now, they wouldn't was in the classroom because it violated the fire law. I mean, the, the the cap on the room was the cap on what's safe in case there's a fire, but there's no room. So theoretically, um, I can have 5,000 students. Uh, I, I don't know how I would, what I would do with that, but um, so if you really want the class and you're on the waiting list and you don't seem to be getting in, first of all, start taking the class. It may take me two weeks to get you on the official rosy, but it doesn't matter, just come, uh, and I don't even know what that means, start taking the class anyway. Usually that means show up to class, don't miss my lecture. But the lecture is going to be unrecorded. So uh, but just don't take that too much for granted, because I do think the class works better when you're more or less up to date. So uh, hopefully there aren't, aren't too many of you guys waiting to watch seven lectures in between now and the final, although that's even, you have a fair amount of time, because um, I'm going to post the final uh, a week before what would have been your final exam date if, if we actually were in a room. And you guys are scheduled for December 22nd, which is, you know, I think that's as late as it can get, noon to three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post 
on the 15th. So you still have a week, but then you, you will need to upload it by 3 p.m. on the, the 22nd. You can upload it sooner than that. I'm still looking, I'm, I've increased the word a little bit. I'm now saying 12, uh, 1200 to 1500 because a lot of people were, but don't, don't, I don't want to give you enough rope to hang yourself. So more words isn't necessarily better. So don't just get all wordy because I said you could have more words. Uh, what I'm trying to do is same with the journals, three, 300 to 500 words. You, you can get a, deep, a good grade with 300. You can, and you might even not do as well with 500. There's no, I don't mark these by word count, but a lot of students said, you know, I have a, I've already said this. Uh, I, um, you know, I really got into my journal entry and I'm at like 680 words. Am, am I going to lose points? And no, you're not. If, if you got inspired and if those words, that word count got up to that level because you were, you actually were doing something significant for yourself, um, then I'm fine. I mean, I, I can, I read them quickly. Uh, I like to read them as, to be honest, it's a, my favorite assignment. Um, and the TAs don't read them and partly so you've got that much more privacy and partly so that the audience you're writing to is the audience you listen to it's it's, it's, it's silly to have the TAs although they are watching these lectures um, but there's so many there's so much nuance in what I've tried to do in this class that that doesn't show up in a correct answer on the final and this is your chance to to, to explore the spaces in between, you know, certain facts like World War One and machine guns or something. Uh, and I suppose you can think of, you might think of the journal, the journal as you're bridging out of this class because it's, it's your final kind of, your, well, it's due before the final, but it's really the, you're writing your way from being someone who listens to this class to somebody who hopefully can adapt w whatever coping issues you want. Um, because once the final is over, then you can do what a lot of these 12 step programs say, which is, you know, when you come in these rooms and you share, take what you need and leave the rest. Now, that's not a good strategy for the final, you know, because you've got to show that you that you took the class. Once the class is over, it's up to you what you remember. It's up to you what what you turn back to, if if anything. One, one question I like to ask my students is, what, if anything, will you remember about this class 10 years from now? And of course, I have students that took the class more than 10 years ago who are still on the Facebook saying, you know, now I can answer that question. Uh, and I remember all, most of it. I still have my notes and so on. A lot of these people are rewatching these lectures 10 years after I gave them. But I never give the same lecture twice. Uh, I mean, there's similarities, but, the, you know, there's not a lot of notes here. This, this is me talking. Um, so I'll say goodbye for now. Uh, I'll be here on on Wednesday um, to open the classroom. And 10% of you, 35 of you, have done your course evaluation. Um, thank you. I, they're, they're, they help. We're about to launch a major in film. And obviously, I've been around, and nobody can fire me. So evaluations don't make or break me. Um, I do care about them. I, but I'm also kind of an old dog, and it, it isn't going to necessarily learn a lot of new tricks. So I don't want to oversell this. I, I kind of am what I am, for better or for worse. Um, so it, I'm getting to a point in my career where you're saying, you know, Professor Leonard has to change his approach. It's, and I can't do much with that <laughs> anymore. But what I do like to hear is, how did this sound to you? Uh, did, did it have value above and beyond? you're fulfilling your humanities credit or, right, or just any credit? And, and if so, why? And also, it's currency for me. If, you know, the deans read this. And one of the reasons that, that we're going to probably make another film hire and, and go to a major is the deans have asked us to because they've read your evaluations. And otherwise, they don't know a damn thing about A10 um, or A11. They don't know whether I'm doing any good in here or not. But, but when they do know, I can go to meetings and say, you know, um, give me the resources to to expand the, the program that the, the students have voted. So, uh, and if you wanted me to see it more immediately, you can be, students stick it on ratemyprofessor.com, which uh, I look at once in a while, um, and that's anonymous too. Uh, 
So please fill out the class evaluation so the deans know what's going on. And, and, and of course, me, but uh, um, that I don't think students always realize that um, it, you know, we're program building all the time, everybody, neuroscience and so on, and who gets resources? It's like everything else, there isn't enough for everybody. Uh, we have to go into a cage match with the other chairs of the departments. And, you know, I'm making this up, but it's something like the university is prepared maybe to off, to allow the uni to allow UTSC to hire 12 new tenure street professors uh, across all the departments. So we have to make a pitch for that. Like let us, let us hire one of the tenure streams, but there's like 25 departments. So half of us are going to get disappointed. Um, because we're not, that we're going to put in for a hire and they're going to say, you know, it's a good idea, but it, this, uh, these other 12 people's ideas are better. They have the students, they have the program there. They are expanding in a way that, that students are responding to. You guys have enough teachers for the, for the, what you're doing. You don't need another tenure stream. So, um, so it's a, it's, it's a, your evaluations increase the pro, my file so I can increase programs that you guys have already indicated an interest in. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a reciprocity, a surprise, surprise, because modernity doesn't have much of that. All right, I got to go because I got actually, believe it or not, I got to do my James Joyce seminar in 14 minutes and hopefully my voice will hold out. And, uh, but I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. Bye for now. As soon as I turn off this.